Welcome to this presentation, The Cycle of Earth's Ages Introduction. My name is Jean-Michel, and my website is jmvedic.com. And the purpose of this presentation is to understand how the earthly experience changes from age to age. And we're going to investigate two prominent Vedic theories about the cycle of ages. Vedic culture, being the culture of ancient India, has preserved in the most detail the descriptions and the qualities of these ages. And it's a subject that's been generally uh, overlooked or people don't have a solid background on how the ages works. And fortunately, we have this information preserved in, in India to this day that gives us a, a, a very strong basis for understanding how the cycle of ages works. And so we're going to see through this presentation how the ages are a canvas for interpreting the rest of history and how historical events can align with the different changes of ages or each age being a strong foundation for certain potentials to happen in the deep past, in the recent, in recent history, and today. And so we're going to do also an age by age analysis and, and look into the details of how the potentials and how the experience of life on earth changes according to each age. And then finally, we're going to talk about what time it is in 2022, at least as get as close as an estimation as we can. So in section one, we're going to look at time as a construct. And in order to understand not only the physical manifestation of the changing of the ages, but to order, in order to understand the spiritual potential of the ages, we have to look at how time works and operates from a con on a conceptual level because the ages are not only involved with the physical changes, they're also dealing with the changes in consciousness, the growth of people on an internal spiritual level. We can't separate these two parts according to the theories of the ages. And that we're going to look at two dominant theories in this section, and then the mathematics behind those theories and how they differ and how they're similar. Then we're going to go into descriptions of each age one by one. Then we're going to see what time it is and we're going to use the precession of the equinoxes, which is a, uh, it's a, an objective measurement that's going to help us align the age cycle and the idea that we're in the Kali Yuga going into Dvarpara Yuga and supporting evidence for why that could be the case. And so astrology and chronology, these are two, these are two methodologies that we're going to be using. First, astrology is the science of the qualitative changes in time such as the opportune or inopportune energetic environments that support or don't support doing certain activities. And then chronology is the science of measuring time quantitatively, so setting numerical dates and time periods to historical events, and also putting together calendars that give a structure to history. But the, the idea that we're, we're, we're dealing with quality of time is going to be the important part of this presentation. How our experience, rather than the actual numerical dates, how our experience is uh, changing over time. And so astrologers have two tools to measure this quality of time. The first is the sky clock, which is measuring the qualitative changes based on planetary and stellar positions. It's our primordial guide for interpreting the Earth's moment to moment energetic environment. It's been used throughout history because it's the most direct connection we have to a changing, to a clock, so to say, that is giving certain vibratory energies on earth. And these, these vibratory energies we can calculate and scientifically show give certain effects. And this is what we do during astrology, during performing of an astrology reading or astrology practice in general. We're not going to be studying the sky clock itself in this presentation because the cycle of ages is the second tool that we can use to measure the energetic environments. But instead of being based on the planetary and stellar movements, we're looking at long-term earth scale vibratory conditions. It's the canvas on which the luminaries are painting. So the energy coming from the stellar and planetary positions have a certain canvas that they put their their energy upon or the paint they're painting upon and as the ages change those canvases change and so when the canvases change 
the potential of the painting changes. So as we switch out canvases, it's going to create a fundamental change in how life is experienced. So by studying Earth's history using the cycle of ages, we're going to be revealing past energetic environments and thus past earthly experiences, but on the macro level. So some questions that we're going to seek to answer in this presentation are how do these larger contexts, the ages, change the energetic environments? What are the, the actual changes and what are these ages causing to change? And what is the relationship between the sky clock and the cycle of ages? Are they related in some way? And we're going to, throughout this presentation, be using the alchemical principle, as above, so below, which is seeing patterns in reality that exist on all scales, from the macro to the micro, which give us clues and signposts to discover deeper truths about how reality is ordered. And one example is the golden ratio. So we have, on a large scale, such as a hurricane, a certain ratio, a certain swirl that we can see on microscopic levels, on a, uh, on a, in a conch shell, in a flower, in certain plants. So this golden ratio we can show in many other forms, but it's just one construct that reality is formulating that give us a clue to, okay, this is a, an objective way that our reality is put together. And we have to go into the, the deeper levels of how the spiritual development works in order to really get a strong foundation to understand how the cycle of ages is operating on us. And so first, time is a construct that we experience during our incarnation on the material plane. But outside of the material plane, there is no time as we experience it in our day-to-day -day lives. So all that is existed before the material creation and will continue to exist after the material creation ends. And this is according to Advaita Vedanta philosophy. And it's a philosophy that is seen throughout history, but it's this idea that things aren't separated as in a dualistic sense. Things are all together one. And all that is exists outside of the material world. And therefore it exists outside of time because time is a component of the material world. And since we as individual souls are a part of all that is, we also exist outside of time. What is that part of us existing outside of time? Well, time is a layer of illusion that's veiling our earthly self from our all-knowing, eternal self that's existing outside of creation, therefore existing outside of time. So the feeling of timelessness when living on Earth is joyfully engaging in our favorite activities, daydreaming, just having fun doing what we love to do, is a deeply blissful experience because it brings us closer to our fundamental existence, existence that is beyond the limitations of time. So if time is an illusion, then why study it at all? Well, our external material condition, living in time, is a reflection of our internal spiritual condition, which is the eternal part of us that lives outside of time. And we're going to see the cycle of the ages is in deeply involved with these two necessities of human life, how we're working spiritually to grow, and what our material life is reflecting that spiritual growth. And the ages give these potentials to live out this balance and to work on balancing these two conditions that we have in time and outside of time. So studying time and the qualitative energetic changes is a way to measure the harmony between our material and spiritual consciousness individually and collectively. So there are so many systems of measuring time and throughout history cultures have passed down their origin stories and histories of the universe. The ancient cultures all had unique calendar systems based on their regions of the world. And many, if not most, cultures have prophecies about the future. So measuring time is a fundamental human expression and all societies are engaging in time in some way. So it's important that we get a strong foundation for understanding how time works whether we understand that it's part of it, it is an illusion and that we have an eternal part of ourselves that exists outside of time, but we're living in the material context. So understanding time is important to, to have a grounded foundation to understand what we're doing here on earth. 
So this is one example of a calendar uh, written in stone from, an, uh, from a culture, uh, the Aztec culture, and it's coming from around 1500 AD, but it's written in stone. It's an important element for uh, understanding their uh, position in the world is having a calendar and, s and measuring time uh, under certain conditions. And so no single tradition has all of the answers. And putting together an ac accurate historical timeline of the past, present, and future is like putting together a million piece puzzle, not made any easier by natural deterioration of buildings and structures and uh, destruction from human action, and also earthly cataclysms, so things are destroyed from natural, uh, either worldwide cataclysms or localized cataclysms, so natural events that wipe out the records that we can use to understand how time is measured from other cultures. And with this, in, this incomplete amount of information that we have, there is no agreed upon consensus about what time it is on Earth, nor the exact location we are in the current Yuga collectively only that we're in the Kali Yuga, nearing the end of the Kali Yuga, or have recently left it. If each culture has a different say on where we are, what do they agree upon? This is where there is no consensus, and this is what we're going to piece together using the Vedic ideas to see from the Vedic perspective where we can position ourselves. And I say that the exact time it is on Earth is the greatest kept secret, because with this information we can predict important changes coming to Earth, cosmic disruptions to society, and having a greater understanding of where we come from gives us more power in the present. So by containing this information and not having it in the public view, it can give certain people power over other people. And some examples of where information was contained in history was the burning of the Library of Alexandria in Greece, a massive loss of ancient information, and then the great library of Baghdad was pillaged by the Mongols in 1258 AD. And this was also an important house of wisdom for past ages, but it was destroyed. And today the Vatican Library allegedly has um, millions and millions of documents that are not available for people to research openly. In order to access the Vatican Library, you need to have very specific credentials. And even to access the lower archives, or the, the oldest archives, is off limits to almost all people. But having this information at our fingertips would give us a lot more information, a lot more foundation for seeing the true, the true history and the cycle of ages and how the cycle of ages is affecting historical events. So the Vedic tradition is the oldest surviving culture and heritage that's preserved the cycle of ages in textual form, in the form of, in the written form. And they talk about yugas. And yuga is a Sanskrit word, the, the language of the Vedic tradition, which means age, eon, or epoch. And above all, it's a cycle of consciousness, which is the human potential to rise to higher spiritual consciousness during their life on earth. So the yugas are cycling through the ability for humans for of human potential to rise spiritually and to grow spiritually and each yuga has an energetic condition that is a polarity between being wholly etheric and material dense materially dense or somewhere in between there so it's having an environmental effect and this environment that we live in this yuga is giving us greater or less so potential to grow in our spiritual consciousness. So really quickly, time is measured both cyclically and linearly. So it's not one or the other. At times, these are there's a false dichotomy between cyclical and linear time. Time is experienced linearly by marking the beginnings of a thing and an end of a thing, such as the birth of a body, and the death of a body, and the birth of the universe, death of the universe. So it's a it's a um, structured period. So you can even say at death, that's the beginning of the decay of the body. And then there's an end of the decay of that body. So we're putting units of measurement together. And these are linear units. But these linear units repeat and thus they create cycles. So the linear unit of an hour, that linear unit repeats. And it creates a cycle of hours, which then creates one day. And then the linear units of day create multiple days into a week and so on and so on. And one 
medium scale, we can say, or medium to small scale is the seasons of the year, which shows how there are units, the individual seasons, that build up into one cycle of one year, which then repeats. And just as there are four seasons in one yearly cycle, there are four ages in the larger earthly cycle. And these four ages are the Golden Age, called the Satya Yuga, which is 4,000 years long, the Silver Age, the Treta Yuga, which is 3,000 years long, the Bronze or the Copper Age, the Varpara Yuga, which is 2,000 years long, and the Iron Age, the Kali Yuga, which is 1,000 years long. So looking at these two clocks, I question why doesn't the whole world use the clock on the left? It's more accurate in the sense that it's more concise. It, it calculates one cycle, on one on the face whereas the clock on the right it has this clock has to go around twice to create one cycle so the base of 12 or 24 because our for marking a day so it's an open question why isn't the clock on the left more common what is the use for having to go around twice on that base of 12. well the two cycle of ages theories are based on this base of 12 or 24 which one is it and many Vedic texts, if not most of them, Srimad Bhagavatam, Mahabharata, and Sura Siddhanta are giving us a 12,000 year cycle as a base. The Greeks were close. They called this cycle of ages the great year. Cicero said that it's a 12,954 year cycle and Heraclitus said 10,800 years. So they're kind of close to 12,000 years, not exactly 12,000 years. But Sri Yukteswar, who was an astrologer and also a, uh, a mystic who wrote a very important book, The Holy Science, which was published in 1894, about yogic philosophy and the, uh, the, the evolution of one's spiritual consciousness. But in the first chapter of his book, he presents his idea of the yugas, and he gives a cycle of 24,000 years, which is determined by the procession of the equinoxes through the zodiacal signs which we're going to discuss later on in this presentation. And in his, in this theory, there's a descending cycle of spiritual consciousness diminishing, where there becomes more of an external material focus, and then an ascending cycle, which is spiritual consciousness focusing more inward, and then the, the external material focus of life is gradually diminished, and the inward focus happens and spiritual consciousness grows. And the Buddhist and Jain traditions, which are derived from the Vedic tradition, also have calendars and cycles of ages using this descending and ascending cycles. So these are the two basic models. On the left, you'll see here that if we, this is the 24,000 year model. If this is zero time, if this is zero or 24, this is the top of the golden age. This is the peak of all spiritual potential, the golden age being the highest of all of the ages. And then as it goes down, this side is the descending cycle. And then it goes into the Tretiuga, the Silver Age, into Bronze, into the Iron Age, where we're down here, which would be 12. And then at here, this is the lowest of all human consciousness's potential. Then it starts an ascending cycle where spiritual consciousness grows again through each age. On the left here, on the right here, we have something similar, but it's only the 12,000. And you can and you notice that it doesn't repeat with these cycles. So at the beginning of the Satya Yuga Golden Age, we're living the Satya Yuga, and then after the Silver Age and Bronze Age, and then back down to the Kali Yuga, the Dark Age, after the Kali Yuga is over, we restart a Golden Age. So you can see the fundamental difference between these two systems. And we're marking them by the 12,000 year model and the 12, the 24,000 year model and the 12,000 year model. And so one correspondence for as above, so below is we can see where, or where else in the world are we seeing ascending and descending cycles? Well, the moon every month during, during the moon's cycle, it diminishes and then regrows again. So this is one correspondence we can see that's happening celestially, that's objectively um, observable that's showing ascending and descending, uh, an ascending and descending nature to it. It's not direct proof that we're that the model of the twenty-four thousand descending and ascending is correct, but it's a correspondence that gives us a signpost. Okay, so these kinds of cycles occur in nature. So some commonalities between these two models. 
Both of these cycles agree on the number on the number count of each of the ages, and each yuga has two transition periods. Periods one that happens at the beginning of the yuga and one happens at the end of the yuga, and each of these transitions is one tenth the length of that full yuga. So, for example, the Satya Yuga has two transition periods of 400 years, Treta two transition periods of 300 years, and so on, which gives the, the total length of yugas, the Satya Yuga being 4,800 years long, the Treta Yuga being 3,600 years long, the Bharpara being 2,400 years long, and the Kali Yuga being 1,200 years long, with the transition periods included. But the first problem is, are we talking about human years or divine years? The 12,000 year model, according to the traditional Vedic texts, is calculated in divine years, which also called years of the devas or years of the gods. One divine year, one year for a god is 360 human years. So that means that the 12,000 year cycle is 4,320,000 human years long. So when we're talking about a 12,000 year model, it's actually 4 million years long, according to that theory. However, the 24,000 year model is calculated in solar years or human years, the time it takes for the sun to go around once the zodiacal belt and arrive back at the same place. It takes 24,000 human years to go through that model. Brahma is the creator aspect of God and he is creating the universe and when he dies the universe ends and he lives 100 years long so 1000 yuga cycles is just one day of brahma so one 12000 year cycle multiply that by a thousand of those you get 12 million divine years for one day of brahma and if you calculate out that out into human years one day of brahma is 4,320,000,000 human years, one day. And there's a correspondence with what the scientists of contemporary, um, contemporary science and astronomy says that our universe, since the Big Bang, is 4 billion years old, approximately. And it's interesting because that one day calculation is that, but that's just one day according to the Vedas. So Brahma also lives a night after the day. And that is an it, so that makes the total one day and one night eight billion six hundred forty million human years long, and as I said, he lives hundred years. We're talking in three hundred and sixty day and night years, not three hundred and sixty five, which we'll talk about in a second. So that makes Brahma's lifetime, and thus the lifetime of our single universe, is three hundred and eleven trillion forty billion human years long. Again, it's a massive scale and it's, it's almost too much to fathom, but this is the straightforward orthodox Vedic textual understanding and description of how uh, long our universe is. Both theories have some anomalies in them. So there are a couple anomalies in both theories. The first is that a perfect circle is 360 degrees, but a solar year is 365.25 days. So the Vedic calculations are giving for perfect 360 day divine years. And we would expect that for the sun to make a full revolution in a, in a, in a circle of the zodiac to be 360, but it's not. It's a little bit faster. Why so, is the sun moving quicker than 360? And also why don't, aren't the ancient texts calculating for 365.25 day solar years? If they had such detailed information, why aren't they calculating out to these decimal points? The second is that the procession of equinoxes similarly doesn't work in the perfect um, 12 or 24,000 cycle. And the procession works at 50.29 arc seconds per year with 60 arc seconds making one arc minute, 60 arc minutes making one degree. So it takes 72 years for the procession cycle to move one degree and to move 360 full degrees around the zodiac takes 25,920 human years. So it's close to 24,000, but it's not exactly 24,000. If procession moved at 54 arc seconds per year, we'd have that perfect 24,000 year cycle. So it's almost as if the procession slowed down. What about the ages is giving us a different energetic condition? Well, it's Dharma. And Dharma is our duty. It's our 
devotional attitude towards living our purpose in life. And developing one's consciousness on a spiritual path is the highest form of living out one's dharma. So growing spiritually and growing more inwardly uh, into that eternal timeless element and growing closer to that part of ourselves is the highest way that we can practice dharma. So the ability and potential for humans to successfully live their dharma is described using a metaphor of a bull or a cow in the Vedic texts. Each leg of this bull signifies an attribute that supports living one's dharma. And the four attributes are austerity, cleanliness, kindness, and truth. So the potential to live dharma, this is what's driving, or this is what is changing from age to age. And as the ages progress downward, the ability for humans to practice their dharma is diminished. Each yuga focuses on one aspect of this dharma, and when that yuga ends, that attribute is lost, or it's, it's not properly utilized from that point on into the next ages. So in the Satya Yuga, the bull stands on all four of the dharmic legs. The Treta Yuga, it stands on only three dharmic legs, cleanliness, kindness, and truth, whereas the emphasis is on cleanliness. Dvarpara Yuga stands on only two legs, with the emphasis being on kindness. And Kali Yuga, it only, the, the bull of dharma stands on just one leg, which is the leg of truth. So a summary of section one, the cycle of ages is the long-term gradual change of material and spiritual consciousness on earth. There are four ages, the Satya Yuga, the Golden Age, the Treta Yuga, the Silver Age, Dvarpara, the Bronze Age, the Kali Yuga, the Iron Age. There are two central models to the Vedic idea of the Yuga, of the yuga cycle. One is 12,000 divine years with repeating cycles and a 24,000 solar human year cycle with descending and ascending cycles. There is no, as of today, objective proof for which model is correct, nor whether to calculate in divine or solar years. And each age has a unique vibratory potential for the beings to practice their dharma, expand their consciousness, and follow a spiritual path. In the next section, we're going to be discussing each of these ages with more specificity.